Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's broadcast is brought to you by my good friends over at Nature Box. Nature Box offers a huge variety of options that taste good and are just better for you than all the chips and the candy bars and the vending machine junk. Over a hundred flavors to choose from. Stuff like dried California peaches, apple cinnamon crunch, the sriracha roasted cashews, and a whole lot more. And if you haven't tried them yet, you can get your own free trial box and just check them out for yourself. Just log on to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist naturebox.com slash thinking atheist the book has finally released can't believe i'm saying it sacred cows a light-hearted look at belief and tradition around the world it's not a big book it's not a masterpiece of a book it's just a book but it's something i've been working on for a while and these tiny little tweaks we had to the art and changing of a phrase and punctuation here and there inside the book would have normally taken about a half an hour for some reason with the publisher took months to get addressed hugely frustrating and finally it has released you can find sacred cows just you can just search it seth andrews sacred cows it'll pop right up you can find it at amazon.com barnesandnoble.com The Kindle and Nook versions, if they haven't released, they will any moment now. There's an iPad version coming. The audiobook is out. You can find that at audible.com and at iTunes. The audiobook was a blast. Anyway, it's out. Finally, and thanks for your patience. And thanks especially to those who pre-ordered the book. (laughs) They wanted to kind of support me and they wanted to sign a copy. So they pre-ordered like months ago, as early as early February. And they've been just waiting for this thing to be done. It's finally shipping out. I got all my boxes in. I've been signing and shipping. And they'll be all out, I think, by the end of this week. So a big sigh of relief and thanks to everybody. I hope you enjoy the book. Do me a favor, though. When you're finished reading Sacred Cows, wherever you bought it from, Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble or Audible or wherever, go and review the book. Now, I'm not going to do what Kirk Cameron did. Which is to just throw out the blanket request, go and review my work positively. I think that's what he did when Saving Christmas came out. <laughs> like Reviewed by Internet Movie Database is the worst film ever. And so his, his tactic was to compensate and just say, go give me a good review, everybody. Well, that'd be nice to get a good review, but I honestly would prefer an honest review. I'm not going to tell you what to say. Just go say something after you finish it and leave your thoughts at the site where you purchased it, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible.com, okay? Next Tuesday night's broadcast is going to be an interesting show about science. In fact, it's called Selective Science, and it's going to talk about creationists. And it's weird how, in the faith, we used to have this almost a schizophrenic view of science. On one end, we were terrified of science, secular science, and scientists, right? The non-religious scientists, these people are all part of a conspiracy to kill God. They can't be trusted. But the second some science came in that supposedly buttressed our creationist point of view, we put up a bunch of signs, you know, we broadcast it to the world. Look, science proves that God exists. Specifically, our God is true. And so we distrusted and hated science while we also were aching for a chance to use science to prove our point. It was this weird relationship we had with science. And we're seeing creationists and religious people of every stripe attempting to co-opt science and scientists, or at least the brand of science, to sell non-truths, falsehoods, pseudoscience, damaging stuff. Incorrect things being put in private school textbooks, even public school textbooks. How are creationists bending science to their will to attempt to co-opt a generation? We're going to talk to scientists. Next week, I've got Dr. Donald Prothero, the paleontologist and author of the book, 
evolution, what the fossils say, and why it matters. I also have Dr. Barbara Forrest and Joshua Rosenauer from the National Center for Science Education. They're going to be a panel of three people joining me to talk about what is real science, what is pseudoscience, and what creationists are trying to do to use quote-unquote science to prove God. Going to be a fascinating broadcast next Tuesday night. So I'll see you back here for that. One last thing. I'm getting set to be in St. Louis the last weekend of July for the Gateway to Reason event. There are still tickets for that. I'm doing four cities in Texas in mid-August, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas. And if you want to be a part of any of those events or the upcoming North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Florida tours, whatever, you can go to thethinkingatheist.com slash events. All of the dates, the times, the venues, the details are all right there on one page. You can just follow it. A lot of tour stops coming up in the fall, and it's going to be a great time. Coming up on tonight's broadcast, it's actually a presentation I gave a few weeks ago at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention. It's a speech that I expected to get a lot of hate mail for because it tackles some quote-unquote sacred cows, some heroic, almost saintly icons that are supposedly above reproach, above criticism. If you start to say something perhaps untoward about them, or at least question this hallowed image that's been constructed around them, a lot of people just flip out. Surprisingly, I haven't had a whole lot of hate mail yet, but I think it does make for an interesting conversation. I thought it would make for a good broadcast tonight. Now, it's a visual presentation. I will include the video link, the YouTube link, in the description box of this podcast, or you can just look for it on YouTube, Seth Andrews. The speech is called The Mother of Bad Ideas. But I think most of the speech translates, even if you can't see the slides. Uh, so check it out in audio form, and if you want to go back and get the visual element, you can watch this speech a little bit later. Before I play it for you, a huge thank you out to tonight's show sponsor, naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. A website that is catering to the palate pleasers of the world. We're talking about delicious, healthy snacks, better for you than all the junk you get in the vending machines. They've got snacks for pretty much every taste bud. Everything from the Granny Smith apples, to the garlic plantains, to the sweet blueberry almonds, to the garden tomato crunchies. They've got over a hundred delicious options to choose from. You can just fill your online pantry and have them delivered for free right to your front door. Zero grams trans fats, zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero high fructose corn syrup, and they taste really, really good. Better for you, healthier for you, and delivered right to you. It's Nature Box. So check it out sometime tonight. In fact, if you've never tried them before, your first trial box is absolutely free. Go to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. And this is my presentation from June the 20th of this year, the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention, or Free OK. The presentation is titled, The Mother of Bad Ideas. Hi, everybody. Doing an atheist event in my hometown. How awesome is that? I want to talk about facts and ideas this has been something that's kind of been on my mind lately. And I want to start with a story that is kind of a sensitive one, especially in this part of the United States. It has to do with an American quote unquote hero. You may be familiar with the Clint Eastwood directed film, which released earlier this year, made a ton of money. American Sniper, a quote-unquote historical look at U.S. Navy SEAL Chris Kyle, the most lethal sniper in U.S. military history. Now, love him or hate him, the guy was pretty much a badass. Four tours in Iraq, 160 confirmed kills, I think over 200 unconfirmed. Medals out the yin-yang, survived gunshot wounds, helicopter crashes, IEDs, and then some. And he told his story in an autobiography, American Sniper. And this book was used as the basis for the film, which just released. But Chris Kyle's story has been an interesting one because it's polarized readers and it's polarized viewers. You've got people like this guy, Representative Roger Williams of Texas, 
who calls Chris Kyle a hero, worthy of our nation's highest military honor. In fact, at his memorial service, they called him a hero. Had a big jumbotron at Dallas Cowboy Stadium remembering a hero. I think the, uh, the motorcade for the funeral was one of the longest in history, in the United States history. It was pretty amazing. And you got people like uh, Linda West of The Guardian who called Chris Kyle a hate-filled killer. Now, I personally don't fall into either of these camps. I'm interested in something else right now. I looked deeper into the story of this hero, and I found some issues. Many of you may be ahead of me on this, but go with me, okay? The film, which released, I think, in January, falsely links the 9-11 attacks with the Iraqi war. It falsely shows Chris Kyle joining the SEALs after seeing television coverage of attacks on our embassies. It falsely claims there was a $180,000 bounty on Chris Kyle's head. Truth is something more like $20,000, and it wasn't just on Kyle. It was a bounty put out on snipers in general, because to the enemy, they were a huge pain in the ass. So they put some money out, a bounty out on their heads. The film falsely claims that Kyle killed Mustafa. Actually, Mustafa in the film is a composite character, kind of a manufactured villain. There is a Mustafa in real life, but his story is much, much different. In fact, the uh, big kill shot in the film of Mustafa that never happened. The long shot Chris Kyle is most known for happened with an anonymous insurgent. And the film largely ignores the real story of our involvement in Iraq, for good or for ill, the sectarian conflicts and the innocent who've long suffered under the hand of oppression. Now, there are some other challenges with the story, like uh, an article recently published in the Washington Post about some unverifiable, their words, unverifiable claims that Chris Kyle had made. Like how after Hurricane Katrina hit, he and a buddy went down with their sniper rifles and picked off looters who were stealing things. Well, I mean, there's no verification that this ever took place, and if it did, holy shit, right? <laughs> I didn't see that mentioned in the film, did you? Then you've got the uh, lawsuit against former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura. Chris Kyle claimed he punched Ventura out after Jesse Ventura allegedly claimed American soldiers deserved to die in Iraq. He told this story with much bravado, and a jury of his peers ruled that there was no proof an exchange like that ever took place, and a $1.845 million reward was given against the Chris Kyle estate. Wait a minute, where's that in the story? Chris Kyle is depicted in the film. He's a straight up basic good guy, right? The kind we like here in Oklahoma. Red, white, and blue, these colors don't run. We're out there fighting on evil. But the real Chris Kyle is much more complicated much more complex, and I think his story really deserves to be told in more detail. Now, you bring up the darker shades of a hero, and people become very upset, very indignant. And they accuse you of just pissing on his grave. That's not my intention. His story has a tragic ending. He was killed by a very disturbed person at a gun range. I think his murder is a terrible thing. I grieve for his wife and his children. I just think it's a horrible thing. But what I am saying is the real Chris Kyle story, the real story, the actual, factual, evidence-based story does not fit in a box. We tend to deify our heroes, and we fall in love with the idea of who they are and what they represent. Like this guy in Florida. He built a full life-size bronze statue of Chris Kyle in his garage to honor a patriot. Right? We become infatuated with the idea of Chris Kyle, and we all know what it's like to be infatuated, right? Oh, they're so perfect. We stayed up all night talking, and we didn't even get tired. You know, they know me. They just get me. They're so precious. They don't seem to have any flaws. I could spend every waking moment with them. Ugh, right? Pass me the insulin shot already, for Pete's sake. 
There's some chemistry, actually, that happens as we become infatuated. I'm not an expert. I'm just speaking about material that's out there for all, any of us to read. But you can actually see that there, there are chemical changes in us when we become infatuated with someone. And that's why we get kind of a high on being with them. That's why we aren't tired when we've been up talking till 5 in the morning. And that's why they, they seem sort of airbrushed in our eyes, because we're, we're, we've got a rush. And that's why many people say, you know, you should probably hang with this little relationship until that chemistry has changed and you can see the facts of the person more than just the idea. But we live in a binary culture, especially here in the Midwest and the Southwest and the South. Whenever it comes to our heroes, this is certainly the case. To our traditions, our cherished beliefs, it's one or zero. It's A or B, either, or, good, bad, black, white, period. We hate ambiguity. We hate it when it gets messy. And the truth over the idea is usually a whole lot more complicated. But I'm thinking the real story is actually a lot more interesting. I think a film based on the truth of Chris Kyle would have been a much more interesting story to tell, don't you? It's a richer portrait when it's seen in three dimensions. So why are many Americans zero percent interested? Well, I think it's because people fell in love with the idea of Chris Kyle. It's an idea they see as beautiful, and the facts are messy. We want it neat, we want it clean, we want it now. Okay? And you're raining on the parade. All right, fine. It's a film. A piece of pop culture right now. Let's talk about somebody else. Who's another hero? Embraced by millions above reproach or criticism. I've got one. After all, who could ever say an unkind word about Mother Teresa? You feel that? The reaction is kind of a physical one when you say it to some people. You mention Mother Teresa and you look like you're about to say an unkind or a sort of an unpraising word, and the chin goes up and, whoa, uh-uh, right? Stop right there. That's Mother Teresa you're talking about. Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, the Roman Catholic agent of kindness, goodwill, love, peace, help, and harmony. Founder of the Missionaries of Charity, and recipient of the 1979 Nobel Peace Prize. Pure of heart, pure of spirit, a saint, an icon, a legend. Who would ever point an unflattering finger in this woman's direction? She was beatified back in 2003, six years after her death. Now, beatification is when the Catholic Church recognizes that a person has entered heaven and can then intercede on the behalf of those who pray in their name. So you can actually say a prayer sort of to Mother Teresa now that she's dead and she can intercede on your behalf, which to me makes no sense, right? If God's omniscient and knows everything, why would he ever need to be convinced? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why don't you go intercede on my behalf? Wouldn't God already know? What do I need Teresa for, right? This is actually beatification, part of the road to sainthood. And someone beatified is then called blessed, blessed Mother Teresa. What else do I know? What else do any of us really know about Mother Teresa? Let's conduct a little experiment just to yourselves in your own minds. Name three facts about Mother Teresa that don't include her birthplace or the fact that she was a Catholic or nun. Three. Okay, she helped poor people. She was a nun. She, she loved poor people. She was cat, no, I can't, you know, none, no, no. Whoa. Where did this woman come from? What did she do specifically? What's the Missionaries of Charity? It sounds awesome. It's even got charity in the title. <laughs> what was that Nobel Peace Prize for? And what actions, specific actions and or words, made her so beloved across the globe? 
Mother Teresa was a friend of the poor. Now, did I know that information or was I sold that information? Did I assume? Which, of course, makes an ass out of you and me. Of course, Christopher Hitchens did a lot of writing about Mother Teresa, and he said, quote, she wasn't a friend of the poor, she was a friend of poverty, and that suffering was a gift from God. Now, hang on just a second. I'm a fan of Christopher Hitchens' work. It was instrumental in my own apostasy, liberation from religious thinking, but as uh, Laurie said in Orange is the New Black, he could occasionally be kind of an asshole. <laughs> so I did some digging. There was an article back in 97 in the Baltimore Sun where Mother Teresa herself had said, rigorous poverty has been our safeguard. Wait a minute. They embraced poverty as a life condition and she required all of her charges at the missionaries of charity to take a vow of poverty so they could simplify their lives and they could relate to the poor people they were serving. There's a woman named Susan Shields. She was a nine-year volunteer at the missionaries of charity. Check that third box, the blue box says. There was the belief the sisters have leverage over God by choosing to suffer. Their suffering makes God very happy he then dispenses more graces to humanity. Suffering is a necessary part of God's model for blessing us. It's a trigger. So we got to suffer so God can be good. This sounds a tad dysfunctional. Mother Teresa said there's something beautiful in seeing the poor accept their lot. To suffer it like Christ's passion, the world gains much from their suffering. Now, the missionaries of charities aren't hospitals. They're what Mother Teresa herself called houses of the dying, a place where the ailing and the destitute could essentially go to be housed and prayed for. They just sort of existed inside those walls. Sally Warner was a 13-year volunteer at the missionaries of charity. She just called it a place where people went to rot away. It was a study, or story rather, in the Huffington Post religion section. I think this was last year. A study by Canadian academics said Mother Teresa was a product of hype who housed the poor in sick and shoddy conditions despite her access to a fortune. Now, look at that image and repeat the phrase to yourself, access to a fortune. This is the home of the dying in Calcutta. When the conditions at the missionaries of charity here were revealed, public pressure forced the missionaries of charity to close down for a complete renovation. It's not all that much better now, but they had to go in because these conditions were absolutely horrible. No permanent doctors on staff, no permanent nurses on staff, no diagnosis for every patient in the door, no rehab programs. Here was the men's bathroom at the home of the dying cut a hole in the bottom of a metal folding chair. Access to a fortune. In my research on Mother Teresa, I discovered she and the missionaries of charity have been in the hot seat for a long time over the conditions in which they house and quote unquote care for the poor and the sick. Volunteers and ex-associates said there were hundreds of people living in deplorable conditions, lying in their own shit. Syringes sometimes washed with tap water Nuns giving out medications often incorrectly, not medical personnel, nuns giving medication, single weekly visits by a physician whose qualifications weren't known, infestations of lice, they're having to shave people's heads, they've got kids cordoned off in rooms with no stimuli whatsoever, right? They're not being educated or helped in any way, they're just taking up oxygen, and reports of nuns shaking or beating kids is a discipline, alarming stuff in an organization set up by the Blessed Mother Teresa. This is a photograph taken from Shanty Dan, a home for the mentally ill in Tangra, Kolkata. If you look at her leg, you'll see their solution for her was to stick her on the cart and just chain her to the window. 2005, a British television crew filmed children at the Daya Dan, which is a care center. People just tied to the bed. 
questions rising about the, quote, primitive practices and lack of using modern methods for teaching. It gets better. Megan Von Tersch out of Portland State University was a volunteer at the Missionaries of Charity. She reported that they used to just wash the surgical gloves, hang them up on a line, and use them again the next day. The focus was on spiritual care, not physical care. Physical care wasn't the big priority. If they were treated, it was largely by people with no medical training. And instead of trying to effectively cure the diseases and mend the wounds to make them physically whole, they were pushed toward believing in Jesus. So if they happened to die, it would be a, quote, beautiful death. Sister Glenda, the head of the House of the Dying, said uh, to Forbes magazine in a 2010 article that of the 86 plus thousand people admitted, 34,000 plus people die. Now, this from the beginning over decades has been the top-down attitude which began with Mother Teresa. Essentially the idea is accept your fate, accept my deity, if you recover, cool. <laughs> hey, if not, at least you died in the loving arms of Jesus. And what, did you think this was a hospital? <laughs> and what stops them from starting a hospital? Surely money is not the problem. This was posited in a book called The Final Verdict, which came out 13 years ago. All right, where is the money going? The Washington Post reported, that uh, there were allegations of the misuse of funds, poor medical treatments, and relig religious evangelicalism in the institute she founded. Now remember, she said there's something beautiful in seeing the poor accept their lot to suffer it like Christ passion because the world gains much from their suffering. The poor should be poor. Suffering is a gift. Ironically, she lived a huge double standard preaching poverty, living prosperity. In fact, when she had physical problems, she sought the most advanced modern medical treatment for herself and visited world-renowned clinics in the United States, Europe, and India. And she was surrounded, believe it or not, by big money, much of it from questionable sources. This was a shock to me. She accepted a whole lot of money from Charles Keating, who's probably best known for the big savings and loan scandal here in the United States. He built 23,000 investors out of their money and the taxpayer bill was $3.4 billion. He ended up doing prison time over the whole thing. Now when Mo Mother Teresa came to the United States, Keating lent his jet so she could just sort of jet set around. Does that sound like poverty to you? Or does it sound like a double standard? Check this out, by the way. When uh, Keating was going through the sentencing phase of his trial, Mother Teresa wrote a letter to Judge Lance Ito defending him, right? Coming to his aid to hopefully reduce his sins. <laughs> and she said, I do not know anything about Mr. Charles Keating's work or his business or the matters you're dealing with. I, I love the way she starts out by saying, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> That's just awesome. I only know that he's always been kind and generous to God's poor and always ready to help whenever there was a need. Well, this is beautiful. Paul Turley is the deputy DA or was for Los Angeles at the time, and he wrote back, why don't you ask yourself what Jesus would do if he were in possession of money that'd been stolen? What Jesus would do if he were being exploited by a thief to ease his conscience? I submit Jesus would promptly and unhesitatingly return the stolen property to its rightful owners. You should do the same. And the response from the Blessed Mother Teresa was nothing, not a syllable. She also had ties to the corrupt Duvalier family of Haiti. They oppressed people by the thousands upon thousands, and stole from the poorest of the poor. It was just horrible. She took their money, probably ignorantly so. Oh, what a beautiful gift. Thank you, right? <laughs> 
When asked how much the charity gets annually, according to the article in Forbes, the then Superior General, Sister Nermal, in a rare media interview a few years ago, remarked, countless, God knows he is our banker. Now, the Catholic Church has an operating budget in the United States of estimated about $170 billion. By contrast, Apple's worldwide operating budget is $150 billion. And you're, you're telling me they can only afford cots? Cots and chains and, and tap water washed surgical gloves? What? What about her beatification? Certainly she was an agent of God's miraculous power here on earth, right? Well, there was an article recently in the Times of India that says that her hallowed in image doesn't stand up to the analysis of the facts and that her beatification was orchestrated. Now, let me explain a little bit about beatification. In order to be beatified, to become blessed, a miracle must take place in which you are somehow directly involved. Okay, so the Catholic Church is now on the hunt for the miracle. They need the smoking gun. And guess what? They found one. This is Monica Bezra. It was reported she was cured of a tumor after she prayed to Mother Teresa while holding a medallion bearing Mother Teresa's face to her abdomen. And she was cured. It's a miracle. Oddly, what was not reported in publications, and especially by the Catholic Church at the time, is at the moment of this miracle, she was also being treated by doctors and taking medication for the condition. That seems like a pretty big omission, don't you think? It's not a miracle. Hell, you want to see a miracle involving Mother Teresa? Check that out. <laughs> That's a miracle. It's the nun bun, by the way. <laughs> Don't tell me that the dough shaped itself by chance. That's divine intervention right there. Monica Bezra told The Telegraph recently, the church made a lot of promises to me. They assured me of financial help, right? They're going to take care of me. All I got to do is play along. Help for me, help for my kids and their education. We're going to have a future kumbaya. And after that, they forgot me. I am living in penury or extreme poverty. One more thing about Mother Teresa, real fast. Letters released in 2007, letters written by Mother Teresa herself to superiors and colleagues over 66 years were compiled and published in book form a book called Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light. And they reveal a woman who for decades wrote about her private unbelief. Such deep longing for God and repulsed, empty, no faith, no love, no zeal. Saving souls holds no attraction. Heaven means nothing. Pray for me, please, that I keep smiling at him in spite of everything. Another letter said, please pray specially for me that I may not spoil his work and that our Lord may show himself, for there's such a terrible darkness within me as if everything was dead. She wrote that in 1953. It has been like this more or less from the time I started the work. That's a quote. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The blessed Mother Teresa may not have been a believer in God, Holy shit! Whoa! Whoa, wait a minute. I've got, the, I've got an idea of Mother Teresa. You know, we, we, we use her as a metaphor, as an adjective, when we're talking about someone who's saintly and pure and wonderful. They're a practical Mother Teresa. We've all done it, or most of us have done it. You're a veritable Mother Teresa. We, we just say it easily, fluidly, because she is saintly. This just doesn't fit. It's uncomfortable. It, I don't know how to process this information, right? Now, you speak to somebody who has taken that idea of Mother Teresa into their heart, and you suggest she may have had a dark side. <laughs> What's the reaction? <laughs> that. <laughs> right? Have we fallen in love with the idea of Mother Teresa? 
I uh, talked to Dr. Andy Thompson, who's a psychiatrist and author and activist out there, and he wrote this in a letter, and with permission, I'm just using it here, talking about why people are so quick, no matter what the facts are, to defend Mother Teresa. They take personal affront to your criticism of Mother Teresa because at a deep emotional level, you attack their mother, their grandmother, their aunt, their older sister, all the real and longed for caretakers in their lives. How dare you attack the person who represents the actual and idealized attachment figures buried in their minds. We've brought them into our hearts and connected with them in a deep emotional way. And we've come to take those ideas personally. You guys are all familiar with confirmation bias, right? Confirming what we already believe, rejecting what we don't. There's in-group bias and favoritism where we actually have taken her into our family. She's now part of our in-group. We do this because group memberships are part of our identity of who we are, part of our social identity, the kind of thing where, you know what, you're not allowed to criticize my kids. I can, you can't that kind of attitude. People naturally get upset when you criticize their grandmother. They freak out even more when you go after their father or their father. Here in the United States, we're big on the founding fathers. Here's another idea that's run wild. The founding fathers, who many believe worship to heavenly Father. There was a recent poll done by the Public Policy Polling Institute, and they polled, uh, like, I forgot, 1,500 Republicans, who said 57% said they would support establishing Christianity as the national religion. And if they had been raised to believe that all the Founding Fathers are Christians, were Christians, well, that makes perfect sense. The idea of the Founding Father figure, these saintly men, how does the idea jive with the facts? When I was a young kid, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, they used to tell us the story about George Washington and the cherry tree, right? Can you guys grow up with that bullshit? Just... <laughs> he took an ax, he chopped down the cherry tree, and his father came out and saw what he had done, and George Washington looked up with his cherub face and honest eyes, and he said, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. <laughs> Oh, the story actually a product of a guy named Parson Weems as a morality tale, which was written around 1800. George Washington's I Cannot Tell a Lie, of course, is a lie. The story is total bullshit. Interestingly, Washington, Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Madison, Franklin, many were slave owners. We want to emulate that? Do we love that idea? Many had extramarital affairs and fathered illegitimate kids, sometimes with the slaves they owned. Founding fathers, indeed. Many were not Christian, often holding to kind of a vague deism which rejected Christianity's core scriptures and doctrines. And those who proclaim were a theocracy founded by and for a single religion apparently haven't bothered to read our own constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise, free exercise, individual exercise thereof. The government of the United States of America, not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Of course, this is part of the Treaty of Tripoli. How much more clear could they be? And yet you bring this to people's attention, especially in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the response is, America. <laughs> America. Love it or leave it, right? Yeah, we're a Christian nation. Don't bother me with all that stuff. I, look, I know, I know we're a Christian nation. It's funny, on the, uh, this last weekend, in advance of this event, uh, the Tulsa World asked me and several other speakers today to be part of an article promoting the event. And I was excited to do so, to give some publicity to a free thought conference happening in my hometown in the buckle of the buckle of the Bible Belt. And immediately I noticed, once the article came out online, I didn't read any letters to the editor, I'm sure there may have been some, but online, if you go to the article, there are a ton, dozens and dozens and dozens of comments, and people really began to sound off, obviously from a religious perspective, on the idea of what you and I are doing today. This is a worship service.
Misery loves company. I look out now at all your miserable, miscreant faces. Sour, dour, joyless, sad, rudderless. Just makes me sick. I mean, how can somebody who knows anything about what we've been doing and how we connect together have the word misery, the first word that comes to mind? It tells us that they have a wrong idea. It's a bad idea. It doesn't line up with the facts. Another comment really fast. What is this immoral communist peddling? <laughs> communist? What? Uh. Is he opening an atheist church in Tulsa or what? And my personal favorite from all the comments posted, I don't know if this was about me or Jason Heap or William Hua. It referenced a he, he didn't, she didn't mention a name, but she said, he should be blackballed from Tulsa. <laughs> Run him out of town. Go get the posse together, people. They got to go. I mean, how insecure do you have to be about your position to have the opposing or any differing opinions or positions or evidence removed from your sight, right? If I was genuinely convinced that I was on solid, sure footing, I would be like, bring it. I can't wait to have this discussion. You know what? Bring your atheist friends. In fact, bring the most qualified people on this subject because I'm ready. I'm so right, I can't even tell you how excited I am about the opportunity to prove God. Instead, the response is, get him away, block the, get him out of the city limits. They don't even get a voice. We, we don't even want to hear it. Why would someone secure in their position ever do that? It makes no sense to me. In this town, what's the Christian idea about the atheist? Well... <laughs> I think we're like the White Walkers in Game of Thrones, okay? And perhaps these religious defenders see themselves as the keepers of the watch. They stand on the wall to protect all of humanity from the encroaching evil. What makes us evil? Because we draw unwanted attention to the facts when people have already become infatuated with an idea. Dr. Caleb Lack has done some great writing on this. There is a chapter in the book, 13 Reasons to Doubt, called Why You Can't Trust Your Brain. Stated simply, belief perseverance is the tendency to stick with an initial belief even after receiving contradictory or disconfirming information about that belief. Anybody here had a conversation where you already won on the facts and it made absolutely no difference? Right? Look right here, it's right here, in black and white. It's peer reviewed and everything. Nothing. Shermer's done some great work about how our beliefs come first, and the explanations, well, those come later. I do love my country. I want it said, I support patriotism, the love of country, not blind patriotism, not nationalism. But I think, yeah, I can love being from the United States. It doesn't mean I don't love the rest of the world. It doesn't mean I don't support other nations. It doesn't mean I think we're better than anybody else, you know? I don't need others to fail, I just want us to be good. I want us to succeed, to have goodness and prosperity. I want to fix our problems. And unlike many, I think true patriotism means you must be prepared at all times to honestly criticize what you see about your country that is broken and damaging and wrong and false. We can be citizens of our nation and we can be citizens of the world. But if we're going to wave the flag, we should understand the implications, the facts behind the colors for the American flag and for the banners of our religions. I grew up saying my pledge of allegiance to this flag. I spent nine years in Christian school. We would go into our classrooms and they would take all the children and they would stand them up and we would put our hands over our hearts and we would say our pledges, the American flag, and then we would say our pledge to the Christian flag and the student would hold the flag out. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior crucified, risen, and coming again to give life and liberty to all who believe.
and they'd bring a young kid out with a Bible, and he'd hold the Bible out, one hand on the top, one hand on the bottom. We'd put our hands on our hearts, and we'd say, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. It's been 30-plus years. I remember every syllable. Tell me. The power of childhood indoctrination is not real. Pledged our allegiance to the good book, the good book, the greatest book ever written. Now, did I know that info or was I sold that info? How do I jive the good book with hate and murder and slavery and dismemberment and genocide and pain? For every verse about loving your wives and your kids, turning the other cheek, blessing those that curse you, helping and healing, and they're in there. There were other verses that Christian pastors and apologists conveniently skip over at Sunday meeting or just excuse outright. Alarming stuff, so we sound the alarm, right? Danger, danger, there are problems here, everybody. Take a deeper look. This is crazy. The Bible is anything but a good book. What's the response? that. And then they say, hey, can I pour you a cup of shut the hell up? <laughs> Real fast, when I was a religious person, devoutly religious, I, I knew evolution's ludicrous, right? Goo to the zoo to you. That's ridiculous. With so many reputable apologists out there, no wonder we believe that evolution is false. <laughs> Sorry, that's a cheap shot, I know. I know. I know. It just made me laugh, so guilty as charged. I was operating without the facts. I had a wrong idea about what Darwin's theory actually was. Living in a Christian echo chamber. When I thought about evolution, I didn't think about this, right? I thought about that. I had bad ideas, wrong ideas. Now, I'm all about ideas, my friends. I really am. And I want to live in a world filled with ideas, especially good ones. But bad ideas abound, and we as skeptics are far from immune to bad ideas. Many in our culture have declared that all religious people are stupid. They use hugely, horribly unhelpful terms like creatard and religitard. Ugh. I just ache in my bones when I hear somebody, well, what, a, what a completely unproductive way of approaching religious belief. All right, makes us feel superior, get a chance to strut around and be right. What have we accomplished? I had somebody send this to me on Facebook. It said, atheist, a thoughtful, honest, ethical, intelligent, skeptical thinker. Oh, I wish that was true. <laughs> oh, I wish it was always true. But the person who sent me this has not seen my inbox. <laughs> right? I've got anti-vaxxer atheists, homeopathy atheists, I've got Illuminati <laughs> atheists, global conspiracies, the faking of the moon landing, ghosts, auras, little green men, you name it, atheists, right? They reject a belief in God. It doesn't mean that they came to non-belief rationally, and it doesn't say really a whole lot about what they might be thinking or how rational they are in the rest of their lives. It just means they don't believe in God, period. We have to go deeper. There's a phenomenon called Spinoza's conjecture, named after the 17th century Dutch philosopher Benedict Spinoza, that says it's actually harder to reject ideas than to accept them. Right? The mere comprehension is sort of step one. It entails the tacit acceptance of it being true. We understand it, so it's easier to sort of set in stone. And then analyzing and vetting and potentially rejecting it, well, that's a whole other step. It's harder to be a skeptic. As Mythbuster Adam Savage once said, I reject your reality and substitute my own, which is, by the way, a great t-shirt. H.L. Mencken once said, the most costly of all follies is to believe passionately in the palpably not true. It is the chief occupation of all mankind. So how do we protect ourselves from the biases that we all have? And we all have them. We all fall in love with the ideas. We all are subject to bad info. We all find ourselves drifting sometimes along those veins. Well, the best tool I think we have is the scientific method. 
very useful in separating the good ideas from the bad ones, the substantiated from the unsubstantiated. Now, don't get me wrong, I want to believe, and people in this movement get weird about the word believe, but you know, I don't mind it in the right context. But you know, more than that, more than wanting to believe, I want to know, was that a spaceship? Or was somebody off camera throwing their hat? I really do want to know, even when things get complicated. I want to be about ideas, but I also want to be about the facts. Sagan himself said, it's far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Or if I might quote the great philosopher Gervais, ignorance might be bliss for the ignorant, but for the rest of us, it's a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> I'm convinced you and I can see our world as it really is, and we can still find awe, wonder, beauty, joy. We can discover people and things worth admiring and celebrating. You know, when I was a believer, if I had seen the idea of a Rebecca Witzman, I may not have given the facts of Rebecca a chance. What a cheat that would have been. The reality of Rebecca is much better than my bad idea. She's awesome. Matt Dillahunty, R. and Ra, my brothers, we went on the road together, went to Australia, toured the world. Yeah. Would I have been afraid of them when I was a believer, when I had bad ideas about what they were about? No, the facts of them trumped the idea. The facts are better. Being in a room full of people who don't believe in God, I once would have been terrified at the prospect, and now I find myself just smiling. Your family. You are my family. The fact of that gives me great joy. And I believe we can, thank you. And in instances like this and so many, we can feel and be connected to the goodness around us, embracing ideas that are always in search of the facts. We can still be inspired and we can do so without the cheat of ignorance or self-deception. Some say that just because we don't know everything, we can't really know anything. But in my own life, the honest pursuit of the truth, the facts, the evidence has revealed an amazing, sometimes disturbing, often wonderful, and ultimately more satisfying world. Besides, my friends, when you consider the implications of remaining ignorance, well, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you. And that last slide, by the way, was a shot of Luke and Leia from The Empire Strikes Back just before they engage in a big, wet, slurpy kiss. And the caption said, wouldn't you want to know? Anyway, if you want to see the visuals, you can just go to YouTube and uh, type in Seth Andrews, The Mother of Bad Ideas, or I've got the link in the description box of this broadcast. We'll be back here on Tuesday for the Selective Science Show with a panel of actual scientists. Tonight's broadcast has been brought to you by NatureVox. Over 100 great options to choose from with the bold flavors you crave and a way to be healthier while you snack. Just log on to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. And I'll see you next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com